Hello, everyone, dear viewers, dear geotechnical colleagues. Uh, this is another exciting episode. I think it's number 16. This IITT series is going uh, full speed and getting uh, such an importance uh, uh, in, around the world among our friends and colleagues. So this time, I'm going to introduce very important speakers. And they're going to talk about dikes and levees and coastal protection. I'm going to share my screen. So TC201 speakers for uh, this episode. I will start with Dr. Kor Zwanberg. Well, maybe I should start from left to right. Dr. Norma Patricia Lopez Acosta, it was a pleasure meeting you in Mexico. Uh, you are at the University uh, IIUNAM, which is the Engineering Institute for National Autonomous University of Mexico. And you are the secretary of TC201. Pleasure having you here. Dr. Hendra Jinto, um, Jitno, sorry. It was pleasure meeting you also in uh, Indonesia. Uh, your adjoint associate professor, Geotechnical Engineering Institute Technolo of Technology uh, in Indonesia, member of TC201. Can't wait to see your presentation and learn from you, learn from all of you. Dr. Esther Rosenbrand, researcher, advisor, Department of Flood Defense, Technology at Deltaris Delft. Hope to see you in October at your conference. Uh, and uh, Dr. Kor Zwanberg is the chair of TC201, researcher and expert consultant, and also a part-time professor at the University of Delft. Uh, Dr. Kor, be ready, because you're going to be introducing this TC. And the floor is yours. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Let's share my screen. That's this one. I'm sharing. And start we'll a presentation. turn off my mic. If we all turn off our mics. If everything is okay, you now see my screen. And I will start with a brief introduction of our TC. The full name of our TC is Geotechnical Aspects of Dikes and Levees and Shore Protection. And we have about 45 members divided over 22 countries. One of the things we do is sharing knowledge. Most TCs uh, do that. Uh, we try to have uh, conference sessions during international and regional conferences where papers related to dikes and levees are uh, merged in one session. And we have joint publications. And one of these joint publications is on failure path. And later in this talk, Esther Rosenbrand will uh, show you the content of that publication. The publication is also available through the ISMGE uh, library. At the moment, we are working at another uh, joint publication on reinforcement and remediation techniques, but that's ongoing work, work in progress. We hope to present that later. The, although the, the focus of our TC is clear, eh, say, um, making a safe environment against the flooding, protecting ourselves against flooding, if you go into the topic, you will see there's a wide variety of geotechnical topics and issues, and not only in geotechnical topics and issues, but also in uh, engineering background. And that's already reflected in the name of our TC. Yeah? So we are dikes and levees, while dikes and levees are basically the same thing. Yeah? Both are um, water retaining embankments. But we use both words just to make sure that engineers from different backgrounds feel comfortable and recognize the work of our TC. Before we go into dikes and levees, a brief view on, on floods and, and their impact on society. I'm going to show you here some data from the uh, emergency event database. On a yearly basis, these three organizations produce an overview of what happens worldwide. And uh, well, the data for 2023 were not yet available when I checked the, the website. So I have here the data for 2022 and compared to the average of the last 20 years. And then we see when it comes to the number of events, uh, floods are the most occurring natural hazards. But well, the number of events is not important, it's their impact on society, and that's reflected in the following data. 
here we have the number of deaths for each of the different uh, natural hazards. And then we see that extreme temperature, earthquakes and storms are having a larger impact. Although... This is such time, such an important slide. I'm slowing you down so mm -hmm. I can take yeah. a photo. It's, uh, so can we summarize what was the worst? The yeah. earthquake? Earthquakes has the, the largest temperature of death, followed by storm uh, on average. But in 2022, it was extreme temperature, which had the largest uh, number of deaths. Wow. Uh, and, and still, although floods were not the most severe, we still have five floods in the top 10 most deadly events in 2022. And the fact that floods yeah, do... You know, this is important uh, for the GeoWeb. Mm -hmm. Project. I don't know if you heard of it. We're launching uh, Geoengineers Without Borders, mm -hmm. and we are now member of the United Nations uh, Disaster Response Unit. So yeah. it's taking, it's moving forward with the lead, the leadership of Pierre Delage. So yeah, yeah. sorry to interrupt, but this is a very no important yeah. uh, slide. Keep going. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we have floods as the most occurring events, but not as the most deadly events. And that's probably explained by the fact that some of the floods occur sufficiently slow, more or less slow, uh, giving people the opportunity to seek uh, safe places at higher grounds. Um, that's reflected in the next slide, where we have the number of people that are affected by the different uh, natural hazards. And then we see that floods... Uh, dominate the, the number of people affected. And remarkably enough, it's a flood and droughts, which are more or less equally important when it comes to the number of people that are affected. And it's a large number, uh, 57 million people in, in 2022. And finally, we have the money. And then we see that storms are the most expensive natural hazards, but floods uh, are, are, are second. And it, this gives you a very brief overview of what we are trying to protect ourselves from. It's this disruption of society, the large number of people that are affected, that need to leave their places and, and, and um, tend to be refuge for a while, waiting until the flood is over and be able to return to their places. Then we make Or if we yeah. like to, sorry, if we like to use this information, uh, for GeoWeb, mm -hmm. do we need the uh, approval or uh, permission from somebody? Or it, it's freely available on on the internet. So I just downloaded it, and I think it's freely available. Um, of course, it's always good yes. to inform. You can send me later the link. I would appreciate it. Yeah. I can forward you the report and the link. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now we Thank take you. a step to dikes and levees. Yeah, this right. is one of the ways to protect ourselves from floods. And there we already see the variability we observe when we go into the field of dikes and levees. On the left, we see uh, a riverbank. Uh, typically, the high water comes once a year. It takes a week or maybe two weeks, at least for the full banks. At the center, we see a dike that has been constructed at some distance away from the, from the channel. So there is some land in the front of the dike. And the dike is typically dry, except for extreme conditions when this land is flooded. And the dike should do its job. Um, on the top right, we see a sea defense. There we have uh, protection against storm surges, and these storm surges might take 24 hours or 48 hours. So on a quite different time scale. But wave impact is very important for these sea defenses, while for the high floods along rivers, waves are not that relevant. And finally, on the right bottom, we see canal dikes, where the, uh, the water level is maintained, more or less constant. And the extreme event comes from extreme rainfall, local extreme rainfall, which temporarily the water level might be out of control, causing some overflow of the canal dike. Um, when we discuss dikes and, and levees, quite often people make the comparison with reservoir dams. And of course, there are quite a number of similarities, but there are also quite some differences. Here we see an example from the United States. So in the left, we see the Mississippi River. And on the right, we see two examples of reservoir dams. 
Um, well, the Mississippi River has uh, levees along them with a height of nine meters. Uh, I, I was born and raised in the metric system, so my American colleagues would say uh, 30 feet. Um, and they run all the way along the length and the stretch of the Mississippi River. And then we have the it's reservoir. Okay, it's okay, I'm metric also. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then we have it's time the... to change everyone to metric. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very uniform system. Uh, yeah. And then on the right we have the uh, the reservoir dams, which are much higher. The San Pablo Dam is about ninety three meters high, and the Hoover Dam is uh, um, about two hundred and twenty one meter high. And the length is much shorter, say three hundred to four hundred meters. So the dimensions are quite different having different impacts on design, on uncertainty, on the impact of uh, ge geology and, and subsoil conditions. The variety is, in dikes and levees is also reflected in the failure mechanisms we observe. So here we have an impression. It's just an impression. There are many more, and these, these fail failure mechanisms might interact and strengthen each other, or maybe even slow each other down. And what we see here on the top left is the overflow, where we have a continuous flow of water over the crest of the dike, um, in contrast to overtopping, which is the bottom on the left side, where we have a discontinuous water flow due to wave action and the wave. So now and then topples over the dike, causing some erosion and impact uh, erosion at the, uh, the land side of the dike. At the center, we see uh, slip failure, slip plane failure slope failure. And the top one is quite shallow and covering the core of the dike. And if now overtopping or overflow would occur, the dike would rapidly erode. And in the center bottom, we see a large failure plane, including the dike and the subsoil. And you should look a bit careful to understand what happens. So what we see here, I'm now using my pointer, the canal used to be over here. You can see the small ship here. It used to be floating in the canal, but now it's on the ground. Here we have the dike and a large lump of soil that has been uh, yeah, moved aside, causing the crack here and the opening, so the canal ran empty. And there we had our failure. At the right top, we have the erosion processes, the subsoil erosion process known as piping. Here we have the dike in the right top. Here we have the low laying land to be protected by this dike over here. And due to seepage, we have a water flow underneath the dike, which has such a velocity that it takes sand particles with it. Erosion starts, which you can see by the sand here. And this erosion causes hollow areas and hollow spaces below the dike. And there we might have some settlement. And it might be the start, the end of the dike. And finally here, uh, an impression of refitment failure. We have the dike over here. Here we have the river. Some previous storm has caused some damage to this revetment and therefore uncovering the, the core of the dike. You can imagine the next high water or storm event might further erode and might further eat away the dike. And so this is just an impression of some of the failure mechanisms that occur. And just to have uh, now a bit of a framework how these um, mechanisms work and how they work together or not work together, we have introduced the, the concept of failure path for dikes and levees, and that's where Esther will uh, discuss a bit more on and show what's in our report. And from this, this general framework, we have taken two examples, one from Mexico and one from Indonesia, to explain a bit more how things look like if you're in the field, having the specific phenomena, and that's what Patricia and, uh, and Hendra are going to, uh, to discuss with us. This was my introduction. You are you are connecting with the other speakers, introducing yeah. them indirectly. <laughs> <laughs> and this is how the framework of this is there. The floor is yours, I think. Yes. Then I stop sharing. This is your last slide, right? This was my last slide. Yeah. Thank you very much. Then I will share my slide. Thank you, Gore. Um, so you can see my slides. Yes, it's there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Super. Thank you very much. Well, I'm very pleased to be here and to be able to present the report on failure paths. That was something which the entire TC201 has worked actively on producing. And it was finalized in uh, the beginning of 2022. And the activities for this report were coordinated by a core team consisting of Rémi Tourmand from France, Philip Smith from the UK, 
uh, and Meindert van Cors Wanenburg and myself from the Netherlands. And in this brief presentation, I will share with you why we decided to come with this report, how we uh, set about producing it and our key findings. So without further ado, um, so why did we want to make this report? And Cor already indicated that levies play a very important role um, in protecting people and the land against flooding. And when we want to assess uh, or design flood defenses, we want to consider different mechanisms that might potentially lead to flooding. And failure paths help us to perform this analysis because in a failure path, you break down what's often a very complex chain of events and mechanisms into discrete events that we can analyze, for example, with modeling. And internationally, there is really a lot of uh, knowledge and experience working with failure path analysis, uh, both in people's minds and in guidelines. And what we wanted with this report was to facilitate this international dialogue, the discussion and learning from each other so that we can share experiences. So what we noticed directly when we started off with our first core team meeting is how important terminology can be. And levies and uh, embankments, like Cor already said, we have a lot of terminology, which also opens up the door to some misunderstandings. So one of the things we did was to propose a glossary that we can use when sharing and discussing amongst each other. And two very important terms in this glossary in the context of this report are the term mechanism and failure path. With a mechanism, we consider a physical process, which can be mechanical or chemical, hydraulic, geotechnical, that could lead to degradation or damage or collapse of a structure or part of a structure. Whereas a failure path is a sequence of events by which an initiating event, which in our case was a high water loading, can lead to flooding. So it's a sequence uh, rather than individual mechanisms. And, um, well, this is what's shown here. However, what we also see in practice is that such a linear sequence of events, uh, it might occur, but often there can be parallel branches or different events which might or might, might not occur. And in order to describe these, we introduce the term failure tree to show that you can have branching. So one initiating event can lead to one or multiple subsequent events and also how different events can lead to then the next mechanism or event. Well, then just briefly about why would you apply failure paths or how can you apply them in practice? We saw that they can be very useful when you want to back analyze a case of a failure. Often it's very complex. A lot of things have happened and you don't have, if there's a flood, often a lot of information is washed away. But by using failure paths, you try to break down which different components might have played a role. And this way you can try to map out what happened and also learn from that uh, how the behavior of levies is. You can also use failure paths for design purposes. Here you actually identify which might be viable paths by which uh, you might have flooding. And then in your uh, design, you can um, verify whether your design actually prevents flooding due to these different mechanisms, or you can design measures. And then risk assessment is what we do for existing structures. So again, we look at what in theory might cause, which failure paths might cause a flooding, and then we can analyze what's the probability of these occurring and combine those to get an overall risk assessment. So then we went to make the report, and this is where the TC really played a very valuable role, because the TC members, um, they all provided case histories of failures, describing what occurred, and doing some back analysis to identify the different failure paths or different mechanisms. And in our report, we have over 15 cases of examples. And what they also did was to collect and make an inventory of failure paths um, based on theory, which are used for assessment or design. And there we have, again, a wealth of information on different failure mechanisms from uh, five different countries. And with this wealth of information, the core team started to set to work 
to construct a general framework, which we call the failure tree, which is intended to produce an overview of the common failure uh, mechanisms and showing how these might interact. And also we worked on a glossary so that we could work from the same shared diction. Then in some fruitful discussions with the TC meetings, we refined this concept. And the next step was that the TC members took the framework and used it to again back analyze their case and also to, for different mechanisms, identify which key parameters actually affect whether these mechanisms take place. Um, based on this, we again updated our framework and also produced an overview of key parameters, which you can think of when you are working on a design or an assessment. And we drew some main conclusions, and this is the information that you'll find in the report, together with parts showing all the uh, case examples, as well as the failure paths that were collected for assessment or design. So now I have a very full and complex slide showing the conceptual framework of the failure tree. So I will slow down a little bit and talk slowly to explain what we have here. And this was intended, our whole work was intended on an initial event of a high water loading. So it can be either a high water situation or wave loading. Um, which eventually leads to flooding. And we know, of course, there can be other causes that initiate uh, levy damage, such as earthquakes, but that was beyond the scope of this uh, analysis. And in this complex framework, our purpose was really to give an overview of common physical phenomena that can eventually lead to flooding as a result of hydraulic loading. And by combining them into a failure tree, we show that it can be actually quite a complex sequence of events. We show how different events might influence each other or lead to next events. And what we also see in practice is maybe you can even have feedback loops or multiple events occurring at the same time. And in this figure, um, I don't know, do you see my cursor pointing? Um, so here we illustrate with an arrow going down from increasing water level that an increasing water level can lead to seepage or increase of pore water pressures, both in the foundation or in the embankment body. We also have double-sided arrows, which indicate one may lead to the other, but it might also be vice versa. Um, and in order to simplify our picture, we didn't show the feedback loops, and we reduced the number of arrows by using these thick black lines, which collect the arrows that come in from above and lead them on to maybe multiple subsequent events. Um, so this is intended to help people to map out uh, what might happen. Um, and in my next slide, I will show an example. For example, Before if you... you uh, yes? Yeah. Uh, I'm a champ. I could understand all uh, these terms except suffusion, if you can explain to me, because I haven't seen this word before. Ah, thank in you. In my practice. Um, oh, but the term fusion um, or suffusion, there are terms um, which are used uh, to describe a process of internal erosion, uh, which occurs in situations where you have uh, often a gap graded soil so that seepage can erode the finer grains through the skeleton of the coarser grains. So it's an erosion process. And the different terms suffusion and suffusion are used to indicate whether there is also um, deformation of the uh, coarser grain skeleton. Thanks for your question. Here I uh, showed an example of how you might use such a framework to identify steps in a specific failure path. So what I highlighted here was how you might have an increase in water level, which can lead to seepage and our increase of pore water pressure in the foundation or embankment body. And this might lead on to uh, slope, sliding slope instability, which can cause a loss of crest, crest height and breaching and breach widening and eventually flooding. So we see we have a sequence of events here. And often the local parameters will be very important to determine which processes take place.
for instance, for slope sliding, the strength and stability of the soil plays an important role. And if this uh, stability is insufficient, you might need to design remediation measures. And this is also what Dr. Henry Yitno will be talking about, a measure for soil uh, reinforcement. And what we also see, of course, flooding can have severe consequences. It can lead to loss of life, economic damages, agricultural damage. But um, we even see that there can be um, enough nuisance when you only have seepage, especially in the case when you have also pollution in the river or in the subsurface. And Dr. Norma Patricia Lopez Acosta will talk some more about seepage and pollution and how that can play a role. And then our main uh, lessons from the applications was, like I mentioned already, that the discourse among practitioners from different countries and often from different area of expertise, it really helps to have a shared terminology. Uh, and therefore, we try to provide this with the glossary. We also see that although we have very nice theoretical failure paths, uh, reality is often very complicated. Uh, and you also always have to um, keep in mind that models which we use uh, might not fully be able to capture all the specifics of a, of a site. And that's why it's also very important to have good knowledge and understanding of the performance of levies and the failure, which will really help in design and assessment. And what we saw in a lot of the cases that were analyzed was that local features, some weak links such as transitions, geological features, localized erosion um, can really be the, the causes of failure. Um, so that really shows how uh, the design and assessment of levies is, uh, requires expertise, knowledge, and uh, yeah, we hope that by facilitating the exchange of knowledge amongst practitioners, we, uh, we help to, uh, to learn, help each other learn more. And the report, Cor also already showed our DOI. You can find it via the uh, ISSM GE website and via this uh, DOI, which I'm sharing in my screen. I'm clicking on the blue to go there, but it's not the only thing. <laughs> ah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm taking photo. Thank you so much. It's definitely a part of the virtual university course. <laughs> so important. I want to share something before giving the floor to Professor Hendra. Oh. Um, I am, my spirit is to go help. Many people, my friends know that. So I was in Austin and I watched on the news the floods of Harvey in Houston, if you remember this big flood. So I jumped and tied my boat to my truck and I went to help for two days, no sleep. It's a nightmare, guys. You will not believe. You know, with my boat, I was able to literally touch the stoplights. This is how much water there was. But but I don't want to go in details. What surprised me, we found a guy sleeping in his car. I thought he's, he's gone. Barely breathing. So we grabbed him, we, we knocked on the, the car and my friend said, he's alive, he's alive. And I asked him, why are you in the car? Why are you still here? And you know what his answer was? I don't know in which direction to swim at night. Zero lights, no power. So the safest thing for him is to stay in his car until somebody found, you know, and we were lucky to find him. Um, so... <laughs> This is an important subject, and it's touching me personally. Thank you so much. Floor is yours, Andra. Thanks, 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 Mark. Uh, thanks, everyone. So, I'm gonna show my screen. Um, there you go. So hopefully, you can see my screen. So, I'm gonna talk about something that maybe not many people doing it in other country. So this is about bamboo 
pile matter system that's used in Indonesia for building embankment in the ultra soft, maybe very soft clay. Um, so the outline of we this one. We don't have enough bamboo, that's why. So, sorry, Mark. We don't have enough bamboo, that's why we don't. Yes, that's it, right? That's it. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about quickly soft soil problems and then common modern techniques using soft soil improvement. I just want to show that. So just tell you guys that we have this modern technology as well in Indonesia. And then after that, we're going to talk about that modeling all the transfer mechanisms in bamboo pile matter system. Um, and then I'm going to show some application in real life uh, projects. So that's the typical situation what we have in uh, west coast of Sumatra, in Kalimantan, in north of Java. Uh, this is actually very wet areas, uh, swampy, and about, I think about 11,000, maybe about 10% of Indonesian area is actually uh, consisting of a swampy area like this. So um, that's actually another example of typical conditions. We have uh, SPD of zero to six, um, to depth about uh, 25 to 30 meters in that areas. And after that, we have like steep, very steep and hard. So this is the challenge we usually have when we have to build uh, a dike, especially in the big cities like Jakarta, uh, Samarang, Surabaya, in the North Sea, um, which is often uh, threatened by uh, the sea waves and also the um, the um, the uprising uh, sea levels. And then um, this is the failure mechanisms that um, uh, Esther was talking about. We are going to talk about the uh, instability of the foundations and also the uh, the embankment itself. But we're not going to talk about the piping itself here. So, so I'm going to touch on, on the first and second failure mechanisms, not the third one. And then um, this is the, the common modern techniques used in other parts of Indonesia, which is in the big cities. And we have lit a lot of budget and close to the um, a good uh, transport system. Uh, that means we can actually have uh, a good mobilization of the, of, of the equipment and everything. So soil preloading, vacuum preloading, I'll just give, give, give an example um, of what other techniques that we have here in Indonesia. So uh, that's basically it. So this is a similar thing. Uh, the problem is one of the, one of the usually problem we have actually lateral, lateral deformations because of the settlement. And then uh, we can use uh, vacuum preloading to alleviate that or reduce that uh, lateral uh, deformation to uh, to embankment loading. And um, and this is still the same. So this example of constructions method here, when we are using vacuum preloading, put geotextile in, put sand filling, and then put prefabricated vertical drain um, and then we also have uh, prefabricated horizontal uh, drains as uh, a replacement of uh, uh, sand layers, which sometimes is very difficult to obtain in the area of uh, of the swampy areas in, in the regions. And then um, we put the German installations. We also don't forget to put instrumentations because we have to make sure that the settlement uh, is actually measured and um, we we can actually use that instrumentation to recalibrate really our um, calculations. So uh, we measure for pressures increase to, um, to embankment constructions. We also measure the settlement during constructions and during the um, filling. That are the modern techniques that use also in Indonesia, uh, in, in the cities mostly. And then we're gonna talk about the technology that we use in the bush area, this far away from the cities, uh, in the area which having some problems of logistics. And, um, and 
usually you only have very limited height of embankment and uh, the area is submerged all the time with water and uh, the area or the embankment has to be able to uh, tolerate large deformations. And another thing is this quite remote area, which is difficult to achieve uh, by big trucks. And this is the bamboo. I, I believe maybe you don't have much of this in Lebanon, Lebanon or in, in, in the US, I think. So um, we have a lot of bamboos here. So, so we can actually use this as, as part of the technology, um, especially in the area very far from the city. So we have um, bamboo, we actually make as a, a pile, make it two or three cluster, and we dive it, we actually um, push it using uh, excavator. And then after that, we're gonna put some uh, mattress and also consisted of uh, bamboo layers. Sometimes we have to use three layers for layers, depends on the soft, uh, or consistency of the uh, ground and underneath. So this is the filer mechanisms or the flow path uh, that uh, we try to, to tackle the instability of the foundations by putting the, um, the mat underneath that. So the stability can increase quite uh, significantly. Uh, one of the reasons is it actually preventing the failure path not to go to the foundations is actually is more like a rigid body movement. So it's actually re, uh, increasing the stability of the embankment. And then, um, as I said before, distribute the embankment load more uniformly, and then uh, reduce the potential differential settlement underneath the embankment uh, because of the stiffness of the mattress. And then, somehow also provide some buoyancy effect because I mean bamboo is actually quite light and especially when you, you have like three layers four layers even some of the project we we um we have actually using 14 layers of bamboo mattress um how we're going to do that we use just conventional uh technique um we the model these uh, fiction piles and um uh, and um, we use that in the model. And then, of course, we, we can actually reduce differential settlement, we, but we cannot reduce the consolidation settlement in terms of the total settlement due to embankment or to the increase in vertical stresses. And another thing that actually quite important to, to mention here, how about durability? Will it, do, will it last very long? Uh, it it does as long as it's actually under the water. So as long as it's uh, saturated, usually it's it's always um, it's good. One of the project we have is, is built in 1995, and it's still working. As I will show you that. So um, so this is appropriate for embankment in coastal and swampy areas, and um, and how how are we going to model that? We, act, we can actually use a quite modern technique, so well, structure interaction system, and we can use uh, uh, software available in the market, uh, one of the next boxes or FLAC or some other uh, finite element software. Um, it is similar to just modeling a pile of foundation for high risk building. And then uh, this is, I don't want to talk about in detail, so we can model this uh, pile as uh, either um, not to not spring and uh, well, a lot of options we, we have. I mean, if you have flak, there is some options to use as a pile or a beams. Um, but basically, we, we need to use soil structure interaction system approach for uh, modeling these, these problems. And then, how are you going to install it? We we put some cluster three or five as a pile, and then we drive it using. Um, either special equipment or just uh, using the, as I saw before, excavator. Um, and this is that example of uh, how uh, we model or we install or build uh, the mattress. So, so that the modeling and uh, this is the output of one of the project we, uh, we have using Plaxis 2D. So it's plain strain assumptions. And this is, um, one of the project close to uh, in Jakarta, 
uh, a port. And uh, under, yeah, we have actually, as, 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 as Estelle mentioned before, we have one of the side actually oceans with uh, wave loading. Um, we also have, Andra, um, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Have you done a zone without bamboo and a zone with bamboo, same area, same location to see the improvement difference? Yes. That would uh, be nice to show the difference in movement. The, the problem, Mark, if you don't put anything, you can't even build an environment. It just failed. Because we are talking about ultra soft soil, you cannot with get there. KPD. Not <laughs> the even port. you cannot get in. No, not even you can. Yeah, basically you can't even go there. I mean, the bearing capacity. You're talking about two kPa times five, ten kPa. I mean, if you're stepping on a thirty kPa, you, you can't even stand up. So, so, so that's the, that's basically the difference. You can't actually build anything. So, um, so it's actually help a lot in increasing the capacity of. You the forgot. Uh, you forgot one very important aspect of this bamboo mat. It's environmentally friendly as compared to. <laughs> now the synthetic people are not gonna like it, or the geofoam people, but you're definitely more environmentally friendly than other solution. That's Absolutely. a major major yeah. advantage <laughs> yeah and absolutely thanks cool. mark and also the color is green <laughs> the bamboo <laughs> yeah that's that's good thank thanks very much um this is the one i, I was saying it's it's built in 1995 uh the, the case we look at actually um it used to be just one lane of uh railway stations in one of the city in in in, in java and um on the left side, actually, that's that actually on here. This this one. Well, let me see if I can see. Here we go. So uh, so in this part, this one actually is just also seaside, and this one here actually land side. But both of them actually some water in here actually railway initially in one lane, and and every time, <laughs> every time uh, the rail. Uh, the train come down the other one has to stop so it's kind of like it's not efficient so um so the the government say well why don't we just build it the problem is here it's very soft and um so we find ways by putting this bamboo uh, mattress and uh we build that so that's the people actually uh building it you can actually see there is no <laughs> no hat 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 nothing it's all this very uh, traditional way to do it and you have this one here, uh, excavator to um, to to drive this uh, cluster of bamboos. Uh, here, three of maybe some of them are five, and then uh, and then you put the geo textile here, geo geo yeah, geo textile or geo membrane there in the top before we put the um, settlement plate. We also put piezometer uh, underneath that. Uh, a mattress to make sure that the pore pressures can be measured when you put the the embankment um and then uh, here we go we put that in uh, the whole thing to the to the side so this one connect to the other side we put the fill there granular fills and then uh, finally we have this uh, embankment and then we model that assuming that the the train actually stuck there. So basically we put a lot of concrete there with even heavier than the, the load of the train itself. So put it there and we measure how much actually it's uh, settled. It actually doesn't settle much. So it actually proved that even if strength stopped there, the environment is still, still uh, stable. So um, here we go. So when you built, you have the double truck and uh, this is just uh, this the, the train in the back. There's a lot of loads there. This is the same train taken from a different uh, 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 angle. So it worked, and it was built in 1995. It's about more than 30 years ago. And this is the data. So you actually you increase that, um, uh, and then you measure the the displacement, and we use this actually to back analyze what we did, uh, we predicted before in the beginning. I think that's it. Uh, I'm gonna show. 
uh, I show this. Uh, this is my colleague. Uh, maybe you met him, uh, Mark, in, in in Jakarta last time. It's my colleague, Professor Masyur yes. Islam. He's yes. he's the one actually pushed this technology quite hard um, and dealing with the government and everybody else here. So thanks very much uh, uh, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. I personally love this technology. Thanks. Norma, the floor is yours. Thank you. Please let You're me know. Doing good on time, my... but okay. You can see, right? My Go ahead. yeah. Play the big screen. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, good day to everyone. I'm very happy to be here with you. Uh, today I will talk about the contaminant transport in river levees. So the outline of this presentation is this uh, five parts that we can see following. Uh, a brief introduction is when we see a contaminated river, we can only observe the surface, garbage suspended in the riverbed or in its river levees. However, we don't think about those contaminants that are dissolved in the water, for example, the heavy metals. On the other hand, we also don't think about the groundwater flows that can occur depending on the topography of the site. Uh, these flows are important because they can cause the contaminant to be carried away. The sum of this behavior has consequences uh, which can be uh, health damages, soil contamination, etc. One way to study uh, is uh, this is uh, through the transport of contaminants, since uh, this allows us to know the concentration of pollutants in space and time. Uh, these are complex issues, therefore, uh, are solved only with numerical methods. Uh, talking about the geotechnic and environment, uh, groundwater flow in soils. Uh, is studied by geotechnics when groundwater flow is contaminated and give rise and, to environmental pollution, they are studied by the environmental geotechnics. To establish whether contamination is present, reference parameters are required. In the study uh, addressed uh, here, contamination occurs by heavy metals, then limits concentration of heavy metal in soils and water. Therefore, the results obtained in this uh, study will be compared with these uh, standards. Uh, you can see that in Mexico, we have a uh, tree that uh, are the more important in water and national assets in soils, uh, in soils about the soil remediation and uh, the for water, uh, I'm sorry, for water for human use and consumption. Okay, mm -hmm. about the, the theoretical framework that we, we have in this case a study, and in, in insaturated soils, the movement of the contaminants occur uh, principally in a vertical weight, as you can see here. In a saturated soil, zones, water function has a transport medium and a pollution plume or a slick is formed. The consequences that we have about the contamination is the following. In the environment and health, in contaminated agricultural soils in Puebla and Tlaxcala, for example, the people planted alfalfa, and when, when they analyzed the plants, they detected leaves in their edib edible parts. Then they fed the region's cattle with alfalfa, and when they studied the milk produced by the cows, they noticed that it also contained leaf. This shows that uh, it is possible to affect the food change. Additionally, in geotechnics, uh, there is a little information about this, but in the University of Querétaro here in Mexico has conducted research on the subject and has shown that in contaminated soil, the geotechnical properties that is affected is the liquid minute. Uh, the atable limit increase in this case, 
Uh, so this is a problem because it affects uh, the compressibility of the soil and we can uh, exper experience catastrophic uh, settlement that can occur. The case study that we uh, show here um, is in the Lerma River. The Lerma River originates in the state of Mexico and flow into Jalisco. Tequila is in Jalisco. <laughs> So the, the left levy of the Lerma River borders the, mun the municipality of San Mateo Atenco in the state of Mexico, specifically when the agricultural, agricultural uh, zone of this, uh, of this town. So you can see here in this uh, slide, the, the Lerma River flows uh, here. This is San Mateo Atenco municipality. And you can see here in orange color, the agricultural land use uh, zone in this uh, municipality. So uh, the main pollutant in the Lerma River are the heavy metal. The protection levy channels the water and provoke an hydraulic head between the water level and the crop fields. You can see here in this uh, picture the uh, housing in riparian zone, uh, the left levy, this is the Lerma River, and this is the protection levies. You can see in this um, cross section the, uh, the left protection levy here. Let me use my laser point. Okay, this is the left protection levy. This is the Lerma River. You can see here the right levy. Uh, in the right uh, side, we have a um, highway, but in the other side, in the left, area, we have a riparian area uh, wh where we um, have crop feeds and housing. The uh, lead concentration in Lerma River is very high. It's one uh, grain per um, meter cubic. The analysis methodology is the following. We use numerical methods by uh, coupled analysis. And both analysis, groundwater flow, but using the CPW software and the contaminant flow, we study with the software Citran W. For the groundwater flow, we use the geotechnical site information, but for the contaminant flow, it's not very usual to have a, a data of the local soil. So in this study, we use a uh, some uh, several bibliographic references. We use all of these parameters, such like, like um, permeability, water content, specific gravity, void ratio, diffusion coefficient, absorption coefficient, longitudinal and transverse dispersion. The um, absorption coefficient is related to soil and contaminant interaction. And the Longitudinal dispersion is the distance traveled by the pollutant in longitudinal direction. And the transverse dispersion is the distance traveled by the contaminant transversally. The results are compared with permissible lead concentration limit according with the Mexican regulation that I can said before. In water and national assets, we use this limit. In soils, we use this limit. And for uh, the water for human use and consumption, we use the a very low uh, limit. The parameters used in the numerical modeling are, are the following. For the groundwater flow study, we use all of these that you can see here. We have uh, here a schematic uh, cross section of the soil in the site. Uh, we have uh, mostly uh, clayly sand for the levy, uh, and then an organic clay with sand, a seed with sand, and an organic clay. We use all of these uh, parameters. And then for the uh, contaminant flow, we use, uh, as I can say before, the Citran software. Uh, and we use all of these parameters, the diffusion coefficient, the absor absorption coefficient, the composition, dry density, and the dispersion. We'll uh, use, as I can say, uh, 
several uh, references in the international uh, bibliographic books that you can see here about these uh, authors. So the boundary condition that we use for the uh, groundwater seepage flow will uh, consider this uh, upstream equipotential boundary line, this uh, discharge line, and this downstream equipotential boundary line. So for the uh, transport of contamination study, we use this boundary condition, we'll uh, um, assume a solute concentration in this uh, orange line, and we use this uh, line uh, like a free solute output. We uh, assume this uh, value for this uh, boundary. And we study in total eight cases. I, I don't say uh, each of one of them. So uh, I've uh, talked about the most important uh, results that we reach out. Uh, in the case of the influence of permeability, we have uh, two cases. The case one is when uh, we have higher permeabilities, and the case two is when we have lower permeabilities. The most important that you can see here is uh, uh, in different color, the concentration of, of lead uh, that we have in the soil. Uh, we study in this case uh, 15 years, you can see that the, um, the higher values uh, are reached here at the toe of the levy. It's the same case uh, for the, uh, this lower permeability. So the most important conclusion that we obtain here is that in saturated zones, water function has a transport medium. So the greater per the permeability, then the greater the transport of pollutants. In this slide, we can see the influence of different dispersion ratios. Uh, you can see here uh, four cases for a, a value of one, two, five, and 20. You can see here the, the graph of these uh, results. In this uh, uh, graph, we can see in, the, in this uh, line, the time in year, and in this, uh, uh, um, in this, in this line, we can see the concentration lead in grain per uh, meter cubic. In this line, you can see our uh, different uh, permissible limits in Mexico. So uh, you can see here the uh, lower value that is uh, 0 po uh, 0 0.01 grain per centimeter cubic, and then the other one. So. Uh, in this case, uh, the most important results that you can see here that is uh, from 10 meters from the top of the levy. Initially, there is a line, a linear behavior when where the pollutant diffuses in a longer time has the uh, dispersion ratios increases. Then the behavior reverses in this uh, in this part that you can see uh, here. So, el, some conclusions about this type of study are the following. Uh, the study of the transport of contaminants allow us to know how far from the riparian zones the pollutant is spread and in how much time. Knowing the distance to which pollution spread allows us to determine protection widths along the riparian zone, contributing to the care of the health of living beings and the environment. And finally, establishing protection widths in riparian areas along the contaminated river will allow updating the land use maps of the municipality surrounding the river, establishing safe limit between the riverbed and agricultural land or inhabited area. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to uh, uh, give our acknowledgement to my student, Viviana Cruz, that uh, he, she helped me to prepare this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you for you and Viviana. This is such an important presentation. It uh, proves that all the technical committees are interconnected. Uh, Marcelo Sanchez has a famous slide for that. You will see it in the new bulletin that will come up this month. Um, you know, TC201 uh, can be TC215 in this case, which is geoenvironmental. And it shows that the levees and dikes are important water barriers, but also important contaminant barriers. And that's why we should make them safe. And I want to thank all of you. This has been a great episode. If you have any questions or something to say now, uh, the floor is open for all of us uh, before we close it. You can open your mics. Yeah, I have one question for you, Patricia. Just at curiosity, if you look at probability of failure and, and, and tolerated probabilities of failure or safety factors, do you apply a higher safety factor for levees that deal with contaminated water compared to levees that are only loaded by clean water? Yes, it's the, the next step uh, to, to continue this study. I think it's very important to um, apply uh, or focus the attention in order to um, suggest um, the use of some barriers in order to um, um, interrupt the contamination into the population or the um, the crops fields. So uh, we, we need to, to perform also a stability analysis and mm -hmm. is the, 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 next, uh, the next study. Yeah, okay, thank you. I have one as well, Patricia, it's okay. So I just want to know, is there any impact or effects of this contaminant to the uh, physical properties of the clay? in terms of, say, liquid limit, uh, liquidity index, or the strength itself, uh, will it have like more uh, structure that make it like more sensitive? Have you done any uh, research and looking at that by any chance, uh, Patricia? No, I, I think in, in here in, in my university, and uh, it, it don't know usual to study the contamination. So, uh, we have a lot of study to to perform el, uh, then in the future. Uh, there, uh, you, you, you said uh, um, uh, uh, stability analysis and, and a lot of uh, experimental uh, test in laboratory and also in the in the field. So. Uh, we have a lot of work to to perform in the future about this topic. It's very important because I I think in all the world we have a a, a lot of uh, contaminated rivers, so it's uh, very common that this uh, a, a very simple example uh, apply in many places of the world. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. I just remember. I we still have time, Mark. Just remember that I mean the sensitivity, this highly sensitive clay in Scandinavian countries actually that's because of leaching of the chemical of, of the salt. I'm just thinking, I mean, out loud here, if that's contaminant actually can cause long-term um effect if if we clean it up. So if if that metal is gonna clean it up. Will it have some, uh, you know, some pores inside that make it like a structured clay similar to uh, the highly sensitive clays in 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 the North European countries? Just yes. just thinking. So, yeah, no thanks. You're talking about uh, similar cases around the world. I will not send you photos of the Beirut River. It's black. <laughs> It's we need to, we need, yes, we need to join the task forces <laughs> to study <laughs> this topic very important yes. in, all, in all the world. Thank you so much. You're welcome.
Okay. Uh, Esther, anybody? Anything before I stop recording? All good? All good. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. This has, this has been a wonderful uh, episode. And uh, I hope to see you in person again soon, especially Cor and Esther, maybe mm -hmm. in Delft. And uh, goodbye. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Right, thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thanks, Patricia. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Bye.